Okay, so uh, my lecture topic is as listed. Uh, we'll speak on traditional aspects of the technical portions, really, of the repairs of the anterior, apical, and posterior compartments. And I'll do my best to stay on time and to do this over the next 30 minutes. As anyone who knows here uh, and, and has had any experience in, in these lectures will appreciate, each one of these lectures can be, in and of themselves, almost an hour long. So I'll do my best to try to cover as much as I possibly can. Um, as, as many of us know, we've been challenged. Uh, there's been a concern that maybe we should abandon traditional repairs, and I'm not necessarily one of them, but I think over, over the last several years, there's been a concern that traditional repairs and the way we've typically done them are doomed to failure. And many of us consider patients perhaps who have uh, you know, first-time occurrences or prolapse, maybe they have thin tissues, sexually active patients, what scenario should we do a traditional base repair, or for those of you who do transvaginal mesh, to consider that? Many of us are challenged because we see patients uh, on a routine basis, and we also have an internal drive. We come to meetings such as this where we're asked to perhaps innovate and think about trying something new. And so why should we use something that really has been about the same for most of our practices for 10 or 15 or 20 years? And, and should we innovate? Should we try something new in an effort to try to improve that? Because I think there's this mindset, as listed here, that traditional failures, uh, traditional repairs are doomed to failure. And, and I think there's a lot of us who believe that's not true, but there's a, a consideration that we should always try something new because we're doomed to failure with those original repairs. Uh, many of us will appreciate the challenges in vaginal surgery, especially in prolapse, the anterior, the apical, and the posterior compartments. So I'll specifically cover the anterior wall first. Uh, again, this is a technique-based review. Everyone has their own subtleties of the technique. I'll just highlight some of the ways we do these, but, uh, but again, feel free to think about uh, the way you perform them. Some of the core elements that you wanna consider with a cystocele, so an anterior vaginal wall prolapse defect, is, is consideration of repairing the central defect, which is the majority of these patients, repairing the lateral defect selectively. I think it's been overestimated over the years. Uh, somehow or another, considering what their urethra and bladder neck support is, because we really don't know, and as we'll show you, there's data more and more considerate that a vaginal sling or other concomitant operation to manage the outlet may be necessary, but may be overstated over the years past, too. And then something at the cardinal ligaments or base of the bladder. And again, this implies someone is going to address the apex, which we'll talk about shortly. So again, looking at any and all of the defects as possible, doing your best to adjust for anything at the apex especially, and then consideration of the outlet or the uh, urethra. So how do we do this? We use liberal hydrodissection. We use typically 10 to 20 cc's of, uh, we'll tend to use a, a 0.5% lidocaine with one to 200,000 epinephrine, but many people use vasopressin or other so uh, solutions. Something to get some hydrodissection into that space because it's really a potential space. There's not a defined layer between the vaginal wall and the vaginal muscularis, but something to get off that tissue so that there's access to the vaginal muscularis. So after the initial incision, We'll typically reflect off the bladder walls, uh, I'm sorry, the vaginal walls to uh, allow the exposure of the vaginal muscularis. Um, previously, I used to use a, a lot of the Vicro mesh. I don't tend to use that now, but something to reduce the prolapse centrally is oftentimes very, very beneficial. Again, when I used to use Vicro mesh, it, it allowed that area to, to push out of the way and then allows the pubocervical fascia or vaginal muscularis to effectively uh, stand up so you can see that easily enough to bring your purchases together of your sutures. I've now transitioned to the use of two OPDS sutures almost routinely, taking uh, purchases of the vaginal muscularis on either side and bringing that across the midline. And again, in a standard central defect repair, you're going to elicit a fairly nice repair in most cases. And this is what the end result would look like otherwise. So um, I'm gonna show you a short movie clip that would Show the same. So after the area has been already hydrodissected, we'll use an anterior vaginal wall incision. Again, consider it to anything going on at the apex. If there is something there that you're going to manage, that'll also be concomitantly managed or first managed. Uh, prior to doing this portion of the repair. Then trying to stay in the quote-unquote avascular plane to stay in between the vaginal muscularis and the vaginal wall. 
And as we continue to dissect around, we'll go all the way laterally to the lateral sulcus and then inferiorly towards the apex. Being aggressive there, if you, especially if you're considerate of anything at the apex to be repaired, and that's what we're gonna show here. So going all the way up, if there is an enteroceal, we'll typically prospectively enter it and then consider that for some form of, a, of an apical vault suspension. So that's again exposing at this level to try to see. If there wasn't a significant apical component, we'll usually place uh, the PDS sutures at the base here, allowing again the, the, the ligaments to, to effectively stand up so we can see and identify them well, typically using the, uh, the 2O PDS sutures. So we'll do that and we'll tie them and secure them in position. And it allows a very nice anchoring point, especially for those of you who like to do other adjuvant repairs or if you want to pass that into the paravaginal space, you can use that as well to do uh, further anchoring. And then really a series of continued interrupted sutures through the central defect of the cystocele. And most often that's more than sufficient for most of our repairs. And these are the lateral portions of the sutures. So again, kind of an up to down is the orientation I like to use. Up to down, previously used Vicryl, but again now I've mostly transitioned to the use of a PDS suture. The advantage, purported advantage, one of them with the mesh centrally was also that it pushes the ureter and the trigone out of the way. Um, it maybe, maybe makes you less likely to get uh, a, a, an obstruction from the ureter. So there's some supposed advantage to that, although I haven't really confirmed that in my own experience, so I've stopped doing that. And then we just tie that into position. So um, again, with, with, with relation to being a mostly a technique-based talk, I won't go into too much data, but I did want to present a couple of data points. So this is a study done uh, several years ago when, when Ann Weber was at, the, was at the Cleveland Clinic in the urogynecology section. But she basically compared patients who underwent what they called a standard corporophy, an ultralateral corporophy, so one going farther out to the side, and a separate one with the addition of a vicral based or, or, or um, absorbable mesh, and compared those three patient, uh, patient groups by a POP-Q evaluation with a median follow-up of approximately 23 months. And, and this is what some of their original and post-operative staging was, and overall felt that the satisfactory outcomes were not significantly improved with the addition of the mesh. So they felt that mesh didn't really make a difference. In, in slight distinction to that, Peter Sand, almost at a very similar time point, did a prospective randomized trial of patients with stage two or greater prolapse with or without the vicral mesh. Now for those of you who know the trial would know that the way the mesh is also placed was slightly different too. Just like in the pictures I showed you is the way Dr. Sand placed it, which is almost kind of put into a ball and reducing centrally and then placing the mesh in that orientation, whereas the Weber paper actually placed it more like a, a shelf or a plate on top of the entire repair. And in this case, Dr. Sand's group felt uh, based statistically that the mesh does make a difference. So again, uh, really the vote's out on the use of a, a vicral based or a, a absorbable mesh. So let's transition now to the vaginal vault because I think this area tends to be a little bit more complicated. Many people don't feel comfortable with it because there is certainly more uh, areas of, of um, problem that could uh, be encountered at the apex. So when you're transvaginally approaching the vaginal vault, considerations when, when you see pictures and, and demonstrations like this, those patients are going to need something at the vaginal vault and apex. So some of the objectives of the vault surgery itself, preserving the normal vaginal access, I think obviously minimizing complications, keeping your blood loss and postoperative complications to a minimum. Repairing all coexistent pelvic floor defects. Uh, many of these patients are going to have a concomitant anterior and a posterior wall defect that I believe in many of them will need to have that uh, repaired. In an attempt to restore vaginal anatomy with obviously consideration to its function. In a patient who's undergoing a copoclaesis, there may be a different consideration than a patient who's sexually active and looking to continue to be so in the future. So vaginal vault suspensions, again, the main things I wanted to highlight with this, despite doing this, as Kim very nicely showed you in the last talk, that oftentimes you'll get a good enough support with the anterior wall and or posterior wall. So every patient doesn't need to have that done concomitantly, but you need to consider it. That does someone need to have that because they may need that managed later on in the future. And so I think you need to be careful and considerate of that at every point in time. This, as, as Kim very nicely showed you in the last lecture, Again, 
All of us should believe that the apex is the real cornerstone of support for the entire vaginal uh, uh, repair. So if you do a good job at the apex, you may not have to do much at the anterior wall. You may not have to do much at the posterior wall. But if you don't do a good job, almost everything is perhaps doomed to failure. So if you take away nothing else from my lecture, remember this. Anterior or apical support is one of the most important components here. All of us know, and we don't have time to cover each and every one of these, but I'll try my best to cover several things, but various forms of transvaginal vault repairs as we've seen here, and, and there's always different twists and turns on that as well, so I, again, won't have time to go over that, but we do have some cases that might highlight some of these things at the very end. The iliococcygeus uh, suspension, it's a nice procedure. It's, it's fairly simple and straightforward. Probably don't get a great amount of vaginal depth with those patients, but many of them you're not looking to get a whole lot of vaginal depth. So you're doing something simply, uh, simply so that you can get some um, apical support, but you don't need to necessarily uh, get too much support uh, where you may have to go up higher into the apex or, or do an intraperitoneal suspension of any sort. But um, the success rates overall are fairly good and satisfaction tends to be fairly high. Um, I won't show too many pictures for that. But I did want to spend a little time on the levator myorophy, which, which, again, a little different. This is transvaginal placement of sutures to the levator complex and shelf towards the midline to anchor the upper vagina. So this is something to really give you some apical support. Again, in a sexually active patient, I think there's a lot of um, uh, benefits for this intracorporeally, or I'm sorry, intraperitoneally or extraperitoneally, depending on how you perform these procedures. We usually use uh, absorbable sutures. You can use non-absorbable. You need to make sure that exposure is not uh, going through the vagina. I'll show you this short video clip that'll help highlight that. So in this patient, you can see the MRI bladder up here, significant apical or enterocele here all the way down below the pubococcygeal line with a fairly large or wide levator hiatus. And as you'll see here, this is the reduction of the apical prolapse and then pulled out. So uh, again, and this is just in the, in the operating room, so you can see a fairly significant apical descensus here. As I mentioned, with cystocele repair, hydrodissection is typically a routine and then making an incision overlying the entire apex. In this case, and I'll show you once this is pulled down again. You can see the anterior wall is actually fairly well supported. So my suspicion is in a patient like this, one may not need to do an anterior wall uh, prolapse repair. If you do a good enough apical suspension, you can oftentimes avoid having to go up farther and, and do an ad additional uh, step for the anterior wall. Again, you can see her support up there is pretty good. So then we're dissecting the peritoneum. So just as in a hernia surgery or other surgeries, intraperitoneally, but we're doing this transvaginally. The peritoneum tends to be extremely thin, so you can tell very easily that this is a thin layer, and prospectively, hopefully, you can enter that as opposed to um, inadvertently entering it. Why? Because bowel can be stuck to that. So if we can feel that, we can sometimes pinch it between our fingers so we can separate out that space. And so after this is completely dissected free, we'll just do that all the way, we'll feel um, posteriorly to see where the idea area of the rectum is and then prospectively again at this point entering the peritoneum at which point we'll see clearly small bowel contents there pulling the peritoneum off and then now we'll reduce that uh, bowel content and push that up and out of the way and so then we'll have a, a pack of some sort being put intraperitoneally to push that up and out of the way so now the goal, as you can imagine, is to use this part of the apex and put this to a new support deep inside the pelvis. So again, at this point now, using the, the levator uh, hiatus or the levator musculature in, inside, we'll take sutures from the outside. And it, now this is when we used to use a different suture. Now we'll usually use PDS again as our, our, our routine. And, and a suture that goes from the outside inside to create where the neovaginal apex will be. And then the higher and deeper and more cephalad you can place that suture, the higher, deeper, more cephalad you'll get your apical suspension. It does use uh, specialized equipment, so the Bryski and Avertil retractors I think are almost mandatory in cases like this, so make sure if you're using these types of surgeries and sutures, you do have ap adequate uh, exposure and dissection for that. So we'll place sutures on either side at that point, 
and then bring them out one centimeter from the entry site so that ultimately when we tie these into position, we'll go all the way up to the apical suspension point in the levator musculature where we did that. Again, exposure of the peritoneal sac, opening it, you can see the bowel here. Placing then after using a retraction up at the higher aspect of the levator complex, bringing that through one centimeter away from the entry site, so that way there's a suture going in, high into the apex, and out one centimeter away. And then ultimately, after some purse string sutures to close over this uh, defect, we'll tie the entire vault in and give a you know, really nice uh, support and suspension. So when uh, Gary Lamac was a fellow with Philippe, they published some of their series from several years ago, and overall good success rates with really minimal complication profiles. And, um, and, and very few patients need recurrent repairs, especially of the apex. Transition now a little bit to uh, sacrospinous ligament fixation. Uh, overall success rates fairly good, so many people are very uh, proactive to this. Uh, the other advantage to it is if you have an insight to uterus, you can use that as a, as a site for the uh, sacrospinous ligament to support the apex of the uterus um, and uterine body, so you can get a sacrospinous hysteropexy as a nice procedure to preserve the uterus, and, and there's fairly good data on that. There's uh, prospective trials that have been done now in sacrocopopexy versus uh, sacrospinous ligament fixation. And again, depending on how you re review the literature, there's some pros and cons on each of these procedures. My preferred operation that I probably do the most of is the uterosacral vaginal vault suspension. And I think this in the United States is probably still one of the most commonly performed apical suspensions we do, especially for those who do transvaginal hysterectomy at the same time. We use the uterosacral uh, ligaments to use as our suspension point. So placing the sutures through normal apical suspension. So this is the higher aspect of the uterosacral ligament. So the concern has always been is that perhaps in a patient who has a thinned out atrophic uterosacral ligament, hence they develop at least one of the pathophysiologies of their prolapse, that why are you supporting it to the same structure? Well, we'll tend to go to a higher portion of that to allow it to be a more secure and stable point of fixation. The thing I also like about it as well, and then kind of almost like Kim mentioned, you know, it may address level one and level two support um, <coughs> continuously. So, so we can oftentimes avoid having to do an anterior uh, or a posterior repair in many of these if we can get a good, deep enough uh, suspension. The problem is this. There is a low but not insignificant complication of ureteric injury, so it can happen. So you need to be very, very mindful of this. So uh, I'll again show a, a movie clip showing the uterosacral ligament sutures going into pos position. So you'll see sutures going in so we'll expose, so imagine this case is a lady who had a, a transvaginal hysterectomy. We'll have the uterosacral ligaments on tags, and then at the high aspect of the uterosacral ligaments, we'll place two or three sutures. Again, my preference now has been to use absorbable sutures, uh, typically, again, zero PDS at the higher aspect. We tend to pull this more medially. Why? Because if you start to go too far deep into the sidewalls, some of the uh, nerve structures are near there. And if you ever do histologic analyses of the uterosacral ligament, you'll appreciate that there's really a whole host of things that could be into that uterosacral ligament. So we tend to pull that medially off of the pelvic sidewall so we can avoid catching any more of the sacral nerve roots. And then you can either dissect off the vaginal wall anteriorly and apically, but the point then is to bring your sutures through the anterior and apical portions and posterior apical portions of the, of the vaginal wall. So when you, again, tie those into position, it'll go up as high as possible to wherever your apical fixation point was in the um, uh, uterosacral ligaments. Some of the things I've done to help avoid uh, uh, ureteric injury is probably staying a little bit lower, so probably aiming at about five and seven o'clock than to try to get your sutures closer to three and nine o'clock, I think um, has helped of us avoid uh, problems with the ureter. If you look anatomically, the ureter and the uterosacral ligament tend to converge on one another as you go distally towards the feet. Now, the advantage then to keeping with a high uterosacral ligament suture is that it'll stay away from where the continuity is with the peritoneum that is uh, contiguous with the ureter. So to minimize the likelihood of a ureteric kinking intraoperatively, 
the, the one maneuver you want to do is try to go as high as possible with your uterus sacroleukin suspension sutures. Ultimately, to get a suspension, something like that, to recapitulate the normal anatomical support. Again, the nice thing I like about it is you're bringing your support sutures anteriorly and posteriorly through the apex, which may then allow for good um, level one and level two support of the anterior and posterior walls. Overall, the data is fairly good. When you look at a lot of the series, complications and reoperations or prolapse tended to be fairly low. Again, most of these are um, retrospective studies. Um, a prospective study done, the optimal trial, really compared the sacrospinous ligament fixation and uterosacral vaginal vault suspension and it had an additional component looking at pelvic floor muscle therapy, randomizing you know, well over 300 patients uh, between 2008 and 2013, and, and again, with, with relatively shorter outcomes, two years, with majority of patients having completed it. Uh, you can see the definition for, for the outcome or success is as listed here. So it's fairly rigid criteria, and, and you can see the success rates between the two groups are fairly comparable, and the addition of pelvic floor muscle physical therapy did not really, really result in any significant benefit in those patients postoperatively. So last but not least, I'll cover uh, posterior compartment repairs. Um, many patients may have a posterior issue. It can occur in up to 50% of patients with concomitant anterior and apical defects. And, and the whole host of things can be more than just the standard rectocele. The patients can have an enterocele, sigmoidocele, perineocele. So there's a whole host of other posterior wall defects that are probably beyond the, the ability to cover in, in a lecture like this in this time frame. Understand, I highlighted symptomatic you need to really be focused on the patient's symptoms if you're gonna treat these. And I think, again, Kim covered this nicely, but these are patients who, many times, we don't really need to do that much for the repair on these, but if they're symptomatic, and, and symptomatic isn't constipation. Remember, half the world probably has constipation, so that's not the actual patient you're looking for. Patients who need to digitate, have significant defratory dysfunction, or a symptomatic posterior bulge are probably the ones I'm doing more often than not. In my training, unfortunately, 10 plus years ago, yeah, I treated and we treated a lot of asymptomatic uh, bulges, asymptomatic rectocele, partly because we thought the size was just a little bit big and I wasn't comfortable leaving it. And then there's probably an aesthetic component where you look, it just doesn't look right. And I can do a beautiful anterior wall, beautiful apical suspension, and I see this posterior wall pushing up. Mind you, you should be very careful to reassess patients in the operating room versus having done that in the office beforehand. Why? Because the operating room, the patients are relaxed. Almost everyone, anyone you operate on, will have some degree of erectocele. So being very careful before you decide that during surgery that you should do that. Again, a little controversial is about at the time of sacral cupexy. If you do a good apical suspension, most of your posterior wall will reduce, and I don't know if you need to always do that. I think we've become more and more selective over the years, but I still do those on occasion when we're doing an apical uh, uh, posterior sacral, uh, I'm sorry, a sacral cupexy of one form or another. Again, the traditional approach, which I will say, I never do this entire thing, but I'm gonna show you all the separate components why? So it may allow you to separate out which technique you, you will use and maybe ones that you'll forego. But using the actual rectus repair appropriately, narrowing the levator hiatus in patients who've got a very wide hiatus. And again, does it, every patient need to have a perineal repair? No. But I think selectively, if you did consider that, you may have to do that. So kind of the rectus seal, the levator hiatus over here, and, and somewhat of a perineal repair. Again, in all aspects of the traditional repair, would one do this? Again, I can't tell you the last time I've really done all of this because it just I just do less and less over the years. So exposure of the perineal triangle. So this is just getting exposure to your bulbal cavernosa, superficial transverse perinei, and external anal sphincter muscles. So after exposing that, we'll use that eventually for the repair. Again, I'd learned you know, 10 or more years ago exposing a posterior vaginal wall triangle. Why? Because this is allowing you then to bring your levator hiatus more towards the midline Again, in someone who has a wide or ex, uh, extremely um, <coughs> disparate levator hiatus. And then exposing your posterior vaginal wall. So again, this is not a, a site-specific type of repair. This is very, uh, you're doing the entire thing. So you're going all the way to the apex of the vagina, either by incising posteriorly, which I do now, or to undermine. Uh, if you're going to undermine, be very careful to make sure you've had, had this area very well hydrodissected so you can get all the way to the apex and then begin then by placating the pararectal fascia back towards the midline, and you can see purchases through this pararectal fascia. You'll usually use some form of a retractor to reduce the central herniation of the rectum. 
upwards so you can expose these parietal pillars or, or fascia as we call it. And then placing a series of interrupted or, or otherwise uh, absorbable sutures. I think when you use non-absorbables in this area, you're going to have more problems. Uh, even the long-acting sutures I've gotten away from, so I'll use usually a, a vicral type of suture here um, as opposed to anything else that lasts too long. I think when patients are straining afterwards for bowel movements, they may tend to spit those sutures out. So I've gone over to slightly shorter acting sutures for that. Again, depending on how much you need to do, you may need to do some sutures here to, to repair the levator hiatus. Remember when women had vaginal deliveries, they'll have an episiotomy, they'll have a tear. That area is completely disrupted in many patients. When we fix those back in medical school and, and you know threw a few sutures in there, that really probably never held uh, for a long time. And so many of them will need to have something done here. If you put your finger here, you'll oftentimes feel almost a dip right at the very beginning of the introitus, and oftentimes, again, because of separation of that tissue layer. So we'll tend to have to do that. Um, additionally, adding, again, selectively a perineal repair to this point to get uh, somewhat of a posterior uh, apical and, uh, and perineal repair as well. Uh, Again, I, I can't tell you the last time I've really done every aspect of that. We just tend not to have to do that. So I wanted to show you every aspect so that you can decide selectively with patients who you'll have to do what portion based on their anatomy and, and what they're bothered by. Looking at the results, overall anatomical cure rates, again, based on retrospective reviews, fairly good and fairly uh, satisfactory uh, for most patients, although dyspareunia and discomfort is going to be very common in a patient group like that. Partly to head that off and partly to say, maybe are we doing too much? Can we just use site-specific defects that are present there? Can we use ones that you can find intraoperatively and be much more selective as to what you do in the repair? And, and again, you can see some of the success rates with this are fairly good. There's some staunch advocates of the site-specific repairs and other fields that it really has no additional advantage to be that specific and that most patients may be adequately served with a more traditional repair. Um, graft augmentation has also been looked at, just the same. Uh, I didn't mention anything on graft augmentation on the anterior apical wall. The one area, because there is some belief, anatomically most certainly, that there is uh, improvements with some of the uh, uh, grafts placed anteriorly. The problem is the posterior wall, we've not seen the same. The posterior wall seems to have more problems and maybe even worse outcomes overall with the use of graft even when you use a biological graft as opposed to a synthetic. Synthetic, for the most part, even for the staunch advocates of synthetic mesh for the transvaginal repairs, will all, almost all admit that they don't do that with the posterior vaginal wall because uh, symptoms and problems tend to be uh, really an issue. So hopefully uh, you'll appreciate, but prolapse is certainly an ever-changing uh, condition and field. Kim mentioned it, I'll mention it, I'm sure Philippe will mention it in his lecture, addressing the apex, if at all possible. It's one of the most important, if not the most important component of your entire repair. So if you're not comfortable with apical suspensions and you're doing a lot of prolapse, you need to either uh, become more versed with this, learn it, go to a, a, a longer course, somewhere that you can learn these aspects because this is gonna be probably more helpful than anything else. Mesh data, uh, you know, there's certainly some improved anatomic outcomes. I did not cover that, but <clears throat> depending on the success criteria you're using, I think we've really, over the years, given traditional repairs a, a short change here, they probably work a lot better than we ever give it credit for. And again, if you're gonna address the posterior wall, my only advice to you is probably to be very selective. I do that, I do them often, but I'm very selective. I don't do any and all component of that. Thank you.